Hey, hey, back again with the second part of the Blood Vessels PowerPoint. So this one concerns veins, and we'll see how far we get before I have to go eat dinner. Alrighty, so uh, we're not going to focus a ton on veins, because we have some more important and more physiological stuff to do. But I will say, of course, that they collect blood from tissues and return blood to the heart. Now, in the systemic circuit, that is all of your tissues... Um, and then that means that that blood is oxygen poor, but in the pulmonary circuit, that means that the blood being collected is from the, uh, pulmonary capillaries that are wrapped around alveoli and that blood is oxygen rich. So the pulmonary veins carry oxygen rich blood back to the heart. So little asterisk there. So in the veins, blood is under much, much, much lower pressure than it is in the arteries. So the veins are essentially a zero pressure system. And if you look at the relative thickness, whoopsie, there we go, relative thickness of the walls, it's not the case that the veins don't have the same set of layers as the walls of arteries. They do. They have a tunica interna, they have a tunica media, they have a tunica externa. It's just that each of those individual walls is thinner. So same layers, different thickness. So that's what that is saying. So the walls are thinner. Um, what this means in gross anatomical terms and also in histology to some extent is that uh, veins are thinner walled, which means they're, they're not as resilient to outside pressure. So they tend to have a collapsed lumen, meaning that histologically their lumen's not perfectly round. And in gross anatomy, for example, on a cadaver, you would notice that the veins appear uh, to be more translucent in appearance than the arteries, and they're sort of quote-unquote baggier, so they're not as springy. They're more collapsed. So in order from smallest to largest, we've got venules, veins, and then the two venae cavae, those being the superior one that drains the head and arms and pectoral girdle, and the inferior one that drains everything else. So earlier I mentioned... Uh, the skeletal muscle pump, and I mentioned that in the course of talking about venous return to the heart as well. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was what that was. So the skeletal muscle pump is as follows. Essentially, it is the action of skeletal muscles squeezing blood past valves such that blood sort of inches its way back up to the heart. So here we have somebody's leg, and this is the posterior aspect of the leg, and then we have the posterior tibial vein. Um, this is sandwiched, nestled right in between um, the soleus and the gastrocnemius, such that during plantar flexion of the foot, when you're contracting your soleus and gastrocnemius to point your toe, um, blood is squished up past this valve up here, and then when pressure is released, blood will fall back down, but it's going to close the cusps of this valve. Um, and then the next time the muscles are moved a little bit more, blood will get squished up. And so it's inch by inch that the blood gets back up to the heart from the lower extremity. So venous valves are important and they provide one-way flow. Uh, when they begin to fail, for example, is when you end up with varicose veins, aka spider veins, because blood is able to fall back down where it shouldn't, and then that puts pressure on small venules, which creates those spidery appearances. So this basically serves to prevent backflow into capillaries and ensure that venous return is decent. So you have venous valves in the veins of your limbs and in the jugular veins. That begs the question... Why not in the thorax? Interesting. So why not in the thorax and abdomen? Well, breathing, so lowering the pressure in your thorax and then increasing it, breathing draws venous blood up inside of the veins in your abdomen and your thorax like a straw. So the principle upon which a straw works is as follows. You put the straw in some liquid, so there's a column of liquid sitting in a cylinder, and then you put your mouth on the straw and you make the pressure in your mouth lower than the pressure in the straw. That causes fluid to go up. Same deal with your body. So when you lower the pressure in your thorax to draw in air, you're also drawing venous blood up 
into your inferior vena cava. So you don't need valves in your thorax for that reason because you're always inhaling, right? You also have, interestingly, valves in your jugular veins. So these are above your heart. And ordinarily, you don't need valves above your heart because, of course, you don't want blood to pool in the veins above your heart and not make it back. The jugular vein valves, so let's draw a really rudimentary internal and external jugular. Oops, I didn't mean to make them join there because, of course, they come off the subclavian independently, right? So that's, that's what I meant to do. So here we have an internal and an external jugular. So instead of the valves being like this, where the cusps face up, these valves are positioned inverted, where the cusps face down. What this is for is so that when you go upside down, blood doesn't fall back to your head and increase the vascular pressure in the capillary beds in your brain, thus increasing intracranial pressure in a way that would be dangerous for your brain health. So the jugular vein valves are important for allowing you to not die when you go upside down. Fun facts about valves. So I mentioned already varicose veins are a result of venous valvular failure. Um, side note, they are not caused by crossing your legs. That's an old wives tale. Uh, they can be caused by prolonged venous back pressure due to things like prolonged standing. So standing for a long time in a row is more likely to give you spider veins than crossing your legs. Vascular sinuses are a little bit different than veins. Um, these are spaces, in the case of the cranium, they're spaces between two layers of dura mater uh, that are going to just collect blood um, and direct it back towards the heart. So why are they not considered veins? Well, they don't have all the layers, so no tunica media, no tunica externa to speak of. Rather, they're more of kind of a space that venous blood collects in. So the dural sinuses are one, and of course the coronary sinus on the posterior aspect of the heart that all the coronary veins drain into is another. So here we have a question, and it's one that might not have occurred to you, and that is, where is your blood? Hopefully it's in your blood tubes, that's where it's supposed to be. If it's not, you have a problem. So just to have a moment and look at this pie chart, and I think you'll find that it's probably not quite what you expected. So if I had asked you previously to showing you this chart, a couple of different things about hemodynamics, which is blood moving through your heart and your blood vessels, I would have said something like, how much blood do you think is in your veins and how much is in your arteries at any given time? Most students answer that question saying 50-50, and they're pretty confident about it. That's not true, however. I would also ask, do you think all of your blood goes through your heart and vasculature with every beat? And the answer is no, but a lot of students answer that question with a yes. So your blood is sort of inching its way around stop and start with your cardiac cycle. It's not all being recycled every single breath and every single cardiac cycle. That wouldn't be physiologically possible. So the answer to this question of where is your blood is it's mostly in your veins. Making up about 64%. So only about 7% of it at any given time is in your capillaries. The reason I keep saying at any given time is because, of course, blood is in constant motion, right? So this is what would happen if you took a snapshot in time of where all your blood was and then divided it up percentage-wise. So the lion's share of your blood is in your veins, and we call this venous reserve. Here's the thing about blood in veins. Although it is oxygen poor, it is not oxygen free. The dropping off of oxygen at your capillary beds by your red blood cells is not 100% efficient, which means that there is oxygen that remains in your venous blood before it gets back to the heart and back to the pulmonary circuit. So 
One benefit of venous reserve is that little bit of oxygen in. The other is that you can perform this maneuver called venoconstriction, which basically can help bring your blood pressure back up in the event of blood loss. So it's a physiological adaptation to prevent hypovolemic shock in times of hemorrhage, where a lot of that blood is squeezed rapidly out of the liver, out of the skin, and out of the lungs, which forces that blood into other vessels and ends up increasing blood pressure globally. So that is what venous reserve is for. It's to avoid hypovolemic shock. Okay, so that was a brief primer on veins and venous reserve and ideas around the differences between veins and arteries. In the next section of the video uh, series about this topic, we're going to talk about cardiovascular physiology. So um, what the relationship is between cardiac output and blood pressure, and also the goings-on at the capillary. So uh, how fluid and substances are exchanged between inside of the blood in the capillaries and outside of the blood, and the relationship between blood pressure, capillary pressure, and interstitial fluid pressure. So that will be in the next video. As always, I thank you for your attention, and I will see you in the next one.